Thank you. It's a distinct pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful to Chris Keith for the invitation and to St. Mary's for uh, having such a, a marvelous venue. Uh, it's really delightful. Chris mentioned yesterday that Benedict, Pope Benedict, had been here before. I'm going to return to Jerusalem just as St. Francis is arriving. So, I'm going to talk basically about this subject of Hasatan or Satan. And I phrase it or pronounce it that way for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that it's not anglicized. And also, normally in the past, as I discussed the figure of Hasatan and the rise of Hasatan, sort of the long literary history, I pronounced it that way because if I said Satan, uh, that conjures up in the minds of all students a particular a set of values. And so there are a number of reasons for my doing that, but I'll do it here, mostly because that's the best way to pronounce it in Hebrew as well. In any case, I'll be using ancient Near Eastern literature and the biblical literature as well, basically attempting to set in broader context uh, the figure of Hasatan and the development uh, of Hasatan in some respects as well. So we'll begin. The Epic of Gilgamesh, I often begin here for obvious reasons, that is to say, Genesis 3 often figures rather prominently in discussions of the devil and in discussions of Satan. One of the things that I often find it very useful to mention in the broader context, therefore, is the fact that within Genesis 3, one of the things that's true is that the Nahash actually functions in a way that's very similar to the function of, of the snake within the Epic of Gilgamesh. You'll remember with me that in the Epic of Gilgamesh, we have Gilgamesh in pursuit of immortality. He's able to talk to Utnapishtim. Utnapishtim tells him that the way that he himself acquired immortality isn't a viable option at this point. So it's not a viable option at all. And so the only mechanism, the only means of, of achieving immortality is by finding this plant in the depths of the ocean. And Gilgamesh goes in search of it, finds it, pulls the plant, uh, plucks it as it were, swims to the surface, is about to partake of the plant that will give him immortality, and then a snake actually seizes it. And this is analogous to the motif that we have present within Genesis, of course, as well. As we move on, therefore, to texts that actually do refer to Hasatan or Satan, they basically group into two different categories in terms of substantival usage. There's verbal usage as well, but I'm going to focus on substantival usage. Basically, we have references in Job and Zechariah, chronicles and arguably numbers, to some sort of a celestial figure. Uh, that is to say, uh, Hasatan is a member of some sort of uh, divine council or court or group within the heavens. We also have references within the Hebrew Bible to Satan as a human figure or human thing. So for example, in 1 Samuel chapter 29 and verse 4, there's a discussion among the Philistines uh, about whether or not David the mercenary, who's been fighting with them, is actually someone that's good to use on a day in battle when they'll be engaging the armies of Saul. And the Philistines say that they believe that David could be a Satan, that is to say they don't want him present. 2 Samuel 19.23, we actually have David returning. Uh, Absalom is now dead. The revolt of Absalom is over. And David sees uh, Shammai. Shammai had cursed David as David was departing from the city, you'll recall, and cursed him in some rather strong language. And as David is returning, Shammai greets him, hoping for some sort of grace. And David gives it. Uh, Abishai uh, states that uh, David shouldn't give grace, but rather should kill him for the things that he said. It's understandable, I suppose, in many ways. In any case, David says to Abishai, you are a Satan to me. 1 Kings 5.18, uh, we have Solomon desiring to build the temple. 
He sends a letter to Hiram of Tyre, indicates that he wishes to build a temple. He needs raw materials. He needs manpower or people power. And he also states that the timing is right because there is no Satan and there is no Pega. Uh, that is to say, there is no Satan, and I'm not defining this for uh, reasons that I, th I hope are methodologically sound. That is to say, I'm not going to force uh, an understanding upon this word. Uh, the word Pega, uh, of course, is the word for revolt or war. So Solomon states that the timing is correct. In 1 Kings chapter 11, we have two different references, one in 14 and one in 25. And basically in these texts, we have a statement about the fact that Solomon during his reign was encountering difficulties, first of all with Harad of Edom, and then also Rezin of Damascus, and they were uh, Satan uh, for him. Then there's another reference as well in Psalm 109 and verse 6. Now I'd like to move for a few minutes, uh, and basically I'm, I'm hopefully constructing a case using biblical materials, the context of the biblical materials, and then at times ancient Near Eastern material, to discuss basically the early history of Hasatan, the celestial figure. So now we're going to move into that, and I realize that obviously much, maybe all, I suppose, of the biblical materials are well known, but for rhetorical purposes, I will summarize certain aspects of them. In any case, you'll remember the narrative very well in Job 1 and 2. We have Yahweh present. Yahweh is now the head of the pantheon, according to this text. Uh, you'll remember with me Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9, when El Yon arguably is the head of the pantheon. Yahweh is among the Beneha Elohim. In this case, it's clear that Yahweh has received a promotion, as it were. Uh, he's the head of the pantheon, and the Beneha Elohim come to him. It's a meeting of the divine council. Hasatan is among them. There's some discussion about whether he's actually a separate sort of figure, not one of the Beneha Elohim, a term that, of course, literally means the sons of the gods. Uh, or whether uh, there's discussion about whether Hasatan is a separate figure or, in fact, one of the Bnei Elohim, and grammatically, both are possible, possible uh, scenarios. And then, of course, the, the family from the land of Uz, you remember basically the way it's discussed. We're told that uh, Yahweh's there, the Bnei Elohim come, it's a meeting of the divine council. Hasatan is there. Yahweh basically says to Hasatan, what is it that you've been doing? There's a play on words and the name Satan within this text as well. And then Yahweh basically says, have you seen Job? And Job is said to be Tam Vayishar. Uh, in other words, sort of upright and, and righteous, something along those lines. And, and then Hasatan basically indicates that he's seen him. And then Hasatan says, look, uh, I think that it's true that he seems to be Tom Vayashar, but I'm not sure that his motives are pure. So basically, Hasatan states, argues, that there should be a, a test to determine whether or not Job, for example, this figure that, that Yahweh has proposed as Tom Vayashar through and through, uh, there should be a test to determine whether or not this is true disinterested piety. And, of course, we know about the test. Round one, property is at stake, but not health. Round two, we actually have health involved as well. I always remind students, because this is one of the things that they often don't recall about the text, is that the text graphically describes just how bad the health concerns were for Job. He takes a potsherd, something uh, many of us have handled thousands of, tens of thousands of, and he takes one of those and, and scrapes it on the, the, the boils of his body. So I, I knew that you wished for that visual image. Now let's continue on, but the writer gives it to us for a reason. Potsherds were part of antiquity. They were everywhere on, on ancient sites. And we see just how graphic, how brutal this is to lose property, including children, which would in some respects be considered property, and then also to lose health. Peggy Day has said this about Job and Hasatan. 
what the Satan does, uh, or what the Satan does, is in fact challenging God's blueprint for divine human relations. In other words, the Satan is questioning the validity of a moral order in which the pious unfailingly prosper. The trust of the trust of true the, the test uh, rather of true righteousness would be the, to worship without the promise of reward. I, I'm going to differ with Peggy Day. Uh, slightly with regard to this, but remember this quotation, and we'll bring it up again as well. Elaine Pagels uh, said this, as he first appears in the Hebrew Bible, Satan is not necessarily evil, much less opposed to God. I think that's basically the case indeed. On the contrary, he appears to be in the book of Numbers and in Job as one of God's obedient servants, a messenger or angel, a word that translated the Hebrew term for messenger, malach, into Greek, angelos. In Hebrew, the angels were often called the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim, and were envisioned as the hierarchical rank of a great army or the staff of a royal court. Most everybody in Hebrew Bible would embrace the first half of this statement and then differ strongly with the second half. That is to say, uh, although there's a strong interpretive tradition within Second Temple Judaism, that the B'nai Elohim were angels, we see it in the LXX, of course we see it in Enoch, uh, the fact of the matter is that that's not the meaning of that term in its ancient Near Eastern context. We actually have B'nai Elohim or the cognate, the, the direct semantic and even uh, linguistic cognate attested in languages such as Phoenician, Aramaic, Ugaritic, and Akkadian as well. And that term means literally the sons of the gods, that is to say the divine children. So this is in some way uh, of referring to uh, a non-divine celestial member, which is the way that we often use the term, it's actually a way of referring, generally speaking, to a divinity, a member of the divine council, literally uh, the sons, uh, the children uh, of the gods. And that's the way that it's used within the ancient Near East, and I think that's the way that it's used in the Hebrew Bible. Of course, in passing, I'll simply refer to the fact that we do have Mesopotamian precursors to this, very important ones. Ludlow Bel Nemeki is one of them. Basically, what I'm suggesting here, and we're going to do more of this in just a moment with regard to Zechariah, is this. Hasatan, and I want to contrast uh, uh, my belief, my construct of the evidence with that of, of Peggy Day's, Basically, I don't think that Hasatan is challenging the divine human relationship or the blueprint. Basically, Hasatan is attempting to discern, as a prosecutor might very well do, the motives. And that's it. Both Job, or both Hasatan and Yahweh are equally culpable in, in this entire scenario. Uh, but both uh, Hasatan and Yahweh presuppose that Job is Tom Vayashar. I think that's true. The question is whether or not there's some sort of motive that's not pure in this. And I would argue that basically Hasatan is attempting to discern, to discern here if there is in fact disinterested piety in the world or rather if people are simply being pious because of the benefits that they receive. And I think that I would also wish to say, rather strongly, I suppose, that Hasatan is functioning in a very laudable way here. That is to say, he's attempting to discern if there is disinterested piety. I think that this is something which is uh, rather interesting, philosophically, to determine, and quite important, and not, of course, an evil pursuit at all. We're going to move now to Zechariah. We'll talk about Zechariah for a few moments. And I want to set the context broadly. And I want to say this first and foremost. Within the ancient Near East, uh, there was a construct that was often affirmed. There are reasons for that that I find to be very interesting. Uh, perhaps you do as well. In any case, the, the way that uh, national theodicy is often framed within the ancient Near East is this, if something bad happens, it's because of divine anger. And we see that within the Mesha stela, for example, within this inscription. The statement is that Kamosh was angry. Kamosh is the national god of the ancient Moabites. Kamosh was angry with his people. For this reason, 
Kamosh gave uh, the Moabites into the hands of the Amrites, that is to say the northern kingdom of Israel. But after a time, Kamosh was placated and all was well, and the Moabites were able to regain territory. We find the same sorts of motifs, for example, in the curse of Agade, uh, Naram Sin was a grandson, as you'll recall, uh, of Sargon the Great. Naram Sin was a, a great conqueror in many ways. One of the things that he conquered, uh, though, was the temple of Enlil called Akur in Nippur. Now, long after the reign of Naram Sin, namely during the reign of Sharkali Shari, Basically, the kingdom of Agade fell to the Gutians. And there was a desire to explain that. And basically, the curse of Agade argued that the kingdom of Agade fell because of the anger of Enlil uh, against Naram Sin for his actions. In other words, part of the ancient Near Eastern construct, and we could give numerous examples of that sort of thing, is that if there's some sort of personal or national disaster, it's because of the anger of the gods. And my reason for focusing on this in some details, I'm going to interact uh, with both Pagels and Day and the way that they wish to sort of understand the things that are occurring in Zechariah chapter 3 in particular. So that's the reason for this prolegomenon, as it were. You'll remember with me that with regard to the campaigns of Nebuchadnezzar II to Judah, that we have reference to a campaign in 597. Jehoiakim, the reigning king in Judah, uh, was deported at that time. Much of the Judean royal family was deported as well. This wasn't the sole campaign of Nebuchadnezzar II to Judah. Rather, there was also the campaign of 587 and the destruction of Jerusalem and all of Judah in 586 that looms even larger. Uh, in our minds. Context is everything, and I, I want to simply mention a few factors about this destruction and the way that it was viewed. First of all, uh, it was a tragic and difficult situation. King says this uh, about it, the famine became so severe in Jerusalem during the siege of 587 and 586 that there was no food for the people. The Poet of Lamentations is even more graphic. The Poet of Lamentations says this, the hands of compassionate women had boiled their children. They became food for them. Desperation reigned, uh, and, and that's certainly the case. Notice this other text from Lamentations. Women in Zion were raped, virgins raped in the cities of Judah, and princes were hung by their hands. This is a very, very difficult situation as sieges in the ancient world and in the modern uh, always are. Uh, we could discuss in some depth also uh, the events that were, did occur at the time uh, of the fall of Jerusalem and, of course, the attempt of Zedekiah to escape with his entire family. And he wasn't successful, of course, you'll remember. And he was apprehended not far away from Rabat Amman. And his two young sons, and they were fairly young, were killed before his eyes, and then his eyes were gouged out. Such is the context. You'll remember with me that it's not only the national theodicy that we see in places such as uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt and Syria uh, that basically state that our country has fallen because of the anger of our God, and you'll, of course, remember there's only one real alternative to that in the ancient world, and that is uh, your God beat my God. Nobody wishes to go there. Uh, that's a problem. And so the only alternative is to say we personally are culpable because of our sins. We see that stated in Kings with regard to the fall of Samaria. We see it stated in Kings also with regard to the fall of Judah. And again, I'm building the case about the context because I basically think that what both Pagels and Day forgot to incorporate was the broader context. And you'll see in a moment precisely how they wish to understand Hasatan, and I understand him quite differently in Zechariah from the way that they do. In any case, you see the, the texts here that uh, 
discuss sort of national theodicy, the anger of Yahweh is basically the cause of the fall. You see it in Kings, you see it in Lamentations, and in fact, you see it at the beginning of Zechariah. Yahweh was angry with your fathers, and thus, thus Yahweh said to your fathers, turn from the paths of your wickedness and your evil actions. Now I want to focus for a moment on a piece that's rightfully famous. Cyrus the Great reigned from about 550 to about 530, and started reigning, of course, in circa 550 in Persia. And this is one of the most beautiful pieces because of what it allows us to see uh, from the entire world of the ancient Near East, the Cyrus Cylinder. I'm sure you're very familiar with it. Perhaps you've seen it here in Britain or during this tour of the U.S. that it's making now. In any case, it's rather priceless and it's, it's brilliant rhetoric. This is a piece that's not written to the Persians. It's written to the Babylonians. It's written in Akkadian. And it basically says this. Look, folks, I'm really sorry that I came here but it was Marduk, the god of Babylon, that summoned me here to destroy you. I hope you'll factor this into your assessment of my actions. <laughs> and uh, I'm absolutely certain that there's a Persian version, and I hope that it's found at some point, and it will say, Ahura Mazda, our god, allowed me to vanquish our historic enemies uh, the, uh, the Babylonians. One of the things that is done within the Cyrus, Cyrus Cylinder is this. The text states, look, folks, Nabonidus, the king that I just vanquished, the last king of Babylon, wasn't really worshiping Marduk as he was supposed to, hence Marduk was anger, uh, angry. Uh, basically, we know that Nabonidus was a, a worshiper especially of Haran, uh, of Sin, the moon god of Haran, and he spent about a decade of his reign in Tema. In any case, Cyrus, knowing this, incorporates all of this, and I think it's rather priceless in many ways, and of course it connects with the anger of the gods that we've seen already. And now I want to move to the Jewish text uh, the text within the Hebrew Bible, and look at the statement here. And I suspect, people debate whether this is an actual letter, uh, and uh, I think that, it, I think that uh, we have probably a fairly good rendition uh, of an actual letter of Cyrus in, in Ezra chapter 1. Uh, and the letter basically says this, Listen, folks, I, Cyrus, came here, uh, vanquished Babylon, he doesn't state all of that, but he basically says, look, I'm going to rebuild for you the temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem, and Yahweh has commissioned me to do this. I think it's brilliant. Uh, if Cyrus was anything, he was really a master diplomat, because he said to the, the Mesopotamians, uh, I came here, I vanquished Babylon because Marduk summoned me, and I'm going to rebuild. Remember that. And he does, it seems. And also we have this version, the version in the Hebrew Bible, in which the text says, uh, uh, I uh, am granting you freedom, and I'm going to rebuild the temple of your God in Jerusalem. So it's rather nice at any number of levels. We also have a lot of information about Darius. And this is the famous Behistun inscription. And... There's a, a closer uh, look at it as well. In any case, this connects with Zechariah. That is to say, these Persian monarchs connect with, with uh, our information about Zechariah. And we have reference here to the fact that Zechariah uh, begins to speak in the second year of Darius. So Darius is rather important for our purposes as well. And the Besitin or Behistun inscription, particularly important also. I want now, and we'll just focus for a few minutes because of time considerations, I want now to focus on some of the actual visions of Zechariah and what they say and what they don't say. And I especially want to focus on both of those things. So we have this reference to the visions of Zechariah. We have reference to the four horsemen. And basically the message of the four horsemen is the land is at peace. Very important for Zechariah. And absolutely the case. And the reason the land was at peace, that is to say Judah was at peace, was because of the Persian 
uh, basically diplomacy in the region of Judah. It was indeed in, at peace, and I think that's the basic thrust. And, and then there's reference to blacksmiths, and the statement in the text of Zechariah is that there were horns, basically the Babylonians, that shattered Judah. Blacksmiths are brought up in this vision, and they're said to be present to smash the horns that smashed Judah. Then we have the measuring of Jerusalem, and it's stated that Jerusalem is going to be so vast that there's really no need for walls. Nehemiah felt differently. But uh, in any case, there's no need for walls, and the city is going to be so vast that it's going to be impossible to have them. Then, of course, there's the court proceeding that we're going to talk about in a moment. Then subsequent visions about Zerubbabel and Joshua, uh, the flying scroll, the woman sitting in the basket, uh, representing, it seems, in purity, which is going to be deported to the land of Shinar, four chariots patrolling as well. And uh, also, finally, the coronation of the branch, Joshua, the high priest. Now, I want to talk for a moment uh, about what's going on in Zechariah 3, at least the way that I see it. We have Zechariah as the high priest. He's dressed in filthy garments. Hasatan basically objects, says this is no way for a high priest to be. He's not pure. This isn't going to be permissible. Uh, basically, uh, uh, Malach Yahweh uh, rebukes Hasatan in the name of Yahweh. There's some textual variants there that uh, will not detain us now. And ultimately, Yahweh concedes the point. And that's something that I think is fundamentally important. Yahweh concedes the point that this high priest, in the condition in which he stands there in this meeting of the council, is in fact not qualified. You may say, well, how do you know Yahweh concedes the point? Well, he concedes the point because what does Yahweh do? And the answer is that he removes the filthy clothing that the high priest is wearing, and he gives him new clothes. If we look at, at uh, both the way that uh, this is conceived by both Peggy Day and also Elaine Pagels, they wish to say this. Look, what's really going on in Zechariah 3 is that there was a conflict within the Jewish community. Basically, the people that were returning from exile were running into difficulties with those people that hadn't been exiled, the non-elites that were still in the land, and that's what this is all about. And basically, the message of Zechariah 3 is to say to those people who'd been in Judah during the exile, no, 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 don't object to Joshua is the high priest, he has Yahweh's support. And they state, you know, so this text and the function of Hasatan, it's all about, it's absolutely all about conflict in Jerusalem between two sides within Judaism, uh, two sides uh, among those that were present in Judah. Uh, it basically this time frame, 520 all the way down to 516. It's brilliant and interesting, but it's actually not rooted in the text. The text makes it pretty clear that what's at issue here is the fact that all of what Zechariah 3 is all about is the, stating the building blocks are all in place. The Persians have been good to us. The land is at peace. Jerusalem is going to grow. The temple is going to be rebuilt. And Joshua is going to be inaugurated. Yes, he was dressed in filthy clothes, symbolizing what? Symbolizing the fact that according to sort of national ideology of Israel and Judah, the reason for the fall was sin. And so this beautiful vision of Zechariah in chapter 3 is basically saying, look, folks, yes, the priest was dressed in filthy garments because that was representing the sin that caused the destruction in the first place, but now we actually have a, a priest who's been made pure by Yahweh himself. In other words, everything can move forward, and what happens with that final vision? Move forward it does, and then ultimately the temple is completed, of course, in 516. So I would say again here, in this context, if we were to ask ourselves, what about this function of Hasatan? Is he good or bad? And I would say basically in Job, he's functioning in a positive manner. He's attempting to discern if there's disinterested piety. And I think the answer to that is, yes, there is disinterested piety. But that's the point. In other words, 
That's the point, and it's actually a pretty good point. In other words, Hasatan, when he begins his literary history, is actually functioning in a difficult way. He's a prosecuting attorney. Now, I suppose that all of us might say, well, prosecuting attorneys aren't the sort of people I wish to spend a great deal of time with. I suppose we could probably discuss that. There might be some former lawyers or current lawyers among us today. Uh, in any case, uh, I think, yes, we could concede the point that Hasatan is a difficult figure and not the sort of person that we might want to go to the pub with and drink a few rounds. But he's fulfilling a pretty valuable function in Job. He's trying to discern whether or not there's disinterested piety, and that, I think, is a positive function. And he gets his answer. Yahweh was right. Uh, and also in Zechariah, Hasatan is basically saying the high priest isn't pure enough as he is. Yahweh concedes the point and then basically purifies him. And I would say here in Zechariah, this too is a positive function. So when Hasatan begins his literary history, and for me it's solely a literary history, uh, I think that it's a positive function indeed. Something different happens, and we'll spend just a couple of moments on this uh, because of time considerations, when we come to the book of Job, or the book of Chronicles. Uh, and we can compare 2 Samuel 24 and 1 Chronicles 21, and I'm sure that you've done that uh, at various times. And uh, in any case, we can see that these are the sorts of things that are going on. There's a census. In Samuel, it's the Ah Yahweh that causes David to take the census. And most importantly, in Chronicles, it's actually Satan. Notice the absence of the article. Maybe we should make something of that. Maybe we shouldn't. I'm inclined to think that it's reasonable to make something out of that, basically because what we know of, uh, to what we know to be the subsequent history of this figure. In other words, I think uh, as many people have said before me, I think that the absence of the article in Chronicles probably suggests something. Uh, and in any case, I, I think this is what's going on. You may say, well, I never liked the Samuel narrative about the census, of, census in the first place because Yahweh looks really bad. Indeed, he does look bad uh, because it, it, it seems that uh, Yahweh at first, uh, his anger causes him to, to prompt David to take the census. He takes the census as Yahweh prompted him to do, and then Yahweh becomes very angry about it. This may seem strange to us, but to an ancient Near Eastern world, it's not strange at all. Because basically, if you look at the gods in the ancient Near East, they must be crazy. Uh, you can look at Enuma Elish with regard to Apsu and Tiamat, Ea and Marduk. They're all doing nasty things at times. Mot to, to Balu, Anat uh, to Akat, very difficult actions. Seth uh, to Osiris and the Isis and Osiris story. In other words, this is the way a god in the ancient Near East acts. They do everything that people do. But at the time that the writer of Chronicles was writing, uh, there was a way to exculpate Yahweh quite nicely. The, the notion of Hasatan was present, or Satan was present, and it simply plugged in. And it's beautiful, because Yahweh is laundered. He's fine. He didn't cause uh, the census to be taken and then become angry about the taking of it. The chronicler is basically the fixer. Uh, he's the janitor in certain ways, and he does a, a lot of that, actually. The chronicler is, uh, or the writer of Chronicles is, is quite good about that sort of thing indeed. And I have some quotations here from people such as Peggy Day and John Levinson, uh, with whom I, I find myself in really total agreement uh, with regard to the way that, that they frame uh, the, uh, the writer of, of uh, Chronicles. And, and I should also note in closing that the Chronicler is good at sort of laundering many things. David is, is really laundered quite marvelously. Uh, Bathsheba is not present. Uh, Uriah's tragic death? No, no, no. Uh, Amnon's rape of Tamar? Not there. Absalom's killing of Amnon? Absent as well. And David's sons, who feasts in uh, 2 Samuel 8.18, they become Rishonim. They become head officials. They're no longer priests because for the writer of Chronicles, this was a, a problem indeed as well. Uh, 
And of course, uh, we see Yahweh laundered as well. So the writer of Chronicles is rather gifted at this sort of thing. He's able to clean many, many things up. And I suppose everyone in the room uh, feels similarly to this. My main point, though, is this. In conclusion, we won't talk about Balaam. I, I want you to see this slide, though, simply because, and I've, I've uh, used a euphemism here, the seer is Satan and the smart donkey. And uh, so, uh, in any case, I think it's rather priceless because in this narrative, of course, what the seer doesn't see, the ass does see. So you actually have an ass who's a chose, uh, and you have a prophet who's clearly not. And there's much that could be said about that. The main point that I want to make, though, and this is the final sentence or two, is this. Hasatan, at the time of his early history, is actually a figure that's doing very good things. And so I differ with, uh, graciously, I hope, uh, but also, I hope fairly convincingly, with some who've written previously about Hasatan's early history, I would suggest basically that he's a very positive figure. Uh, he's attempting to discern in Job the presence or absence of disinterested piety. And I think we would all agree that this is a good thing. And in the Zechariah narrative, he wants to ensure the fact that the high priest uh, of this second temple that's about to begin services is in fact someone who's capable of that. With Chronicles, we see basically a pejoration uh, of the function of Satan. And we see that, of course, continue during the later Second Temple literature. Thank you very much. Let's take one or two questions before. Yeah, first of all, that was fantastic. Thanks. Everybody. No, thanks. No. <laughs> Yes. That's right. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. So along with that, the other thing that's interesting is that Yeah, and I, I would always be disinclined to sort of say it happened in a particular place in time or even in a piece of literature uh, because we, we have a fragment of the literature uh, from antiquity and even less about the sorts of things that they might think, of course, as you know. So I'll usually be general about this. All I know is that he started off as a difficult but fairly laudable figure and then it degenerated. And I think that we see the degeneration in Chronicles, and then, of course, it becomes pervasive in the late Second Temple period, just as you've indicated. Um, how would you respond to the objection that to say that Hasatan is, is very positive in general? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so maybe the, the word very, if, if I could strike that, we might be in more agreement, and I'm happy to strike it, and I wouldn't put it in an article per se, but uh, I often try to, to emphasize the fact that he's not a bad guy when things begin, and often in various contexts, uh, I have to uh, state that uh, in fairly strong terms, and I'm still shot with the arrows at times, <laughs> uh, the poison arrows that come, not from you, but uh, from, from classes, uh, student classes at times, because I, I basically want to say that at the very beginning, he's not the sort of person uh, I would want to, uh, to spend a great deal of time with, because 
he's the sort of fellow who seems to be able to see things too clearly. Uh, he's able to ascertain whether or not there really is disinterested piety. And of course, uh, this can be a difficult process, as, as Joe would, would certainly attest. So yeah, so he's a, yeah, he's a complex figure. What I would mostly say is that the, the attempt to discern whether or not there really is disinterested piety, it's a laudable attempt. The, the attempt to make sure that, that uh, he is, uh, that the high priest is really pure is a laudable thing. Now, some people may say and have said to me at times, look, I think you're giving him too much of a benefit of the doubt. I think that he had ulterior motives in the, the entire thing. In other words, I don't really think that he wanted uh, Joshua to be the high priest, and I don't really think that he wanted Job to come out uh, uh, you know, with flying colors. Okay, maybe not, but I think so. Uh, but what I, what I would want to say is that my reading is at least a reasonable reading, and I would also want to say that many people in discussing Hasatan's early history have read his early history through the lens of his later history, and I think methodologically that's problematic for me. Yeah, you use a lot of language of he. Um, it's a masculine word. Yeah, good point. And uh, do you think that that is a consistent identity, that this is one individual? Nope. Um, so you, you use that language a lot of interesting yep. Yeah, great, great question. I'm really glad you asked it. Uh, right. I use the, the third person, uh, uh, you know, common singular masculine because the text uses that, uh, of course, as, as all of you know, and, and you as well. Uh, with regard to whether or not this is a single figure, a singular figure, I suspect that it's a title. And so I would be disinclined to suggest that it's a particular person. Uh, and I would simply, or persona, uh, I think it's a title. And arguably, from my perspective, uh, at the very beginning, he's a member of the, uh, the B'nai Ha Elohim, and this is a function. And it could be that at one point, uh, Ben number one functions as Hasatan, and later Ben number two does, or something such as this. So it's not, uh, for me, it's not a particular figure, even though we know where the tradition eventually goes, uh, namely to consider this to be a single figure. But I, I would argue that that's probably not uh, the beginning point, but it's absolutely impossible to know with certainty whether or not uh, the writer of Job and Zechariah and Chronicles all had the very same figure in mind or simply the title. So great question. I'm really glad you asked it. Maybe I didn't tease that out a little bit. If it's more of a role function, mm -hmm. not so much that you're naming it. Yes. I wonder if that allows a little bit more flexibility in terms of personality. All right, this is, you're adding a lot of this. Well, maybe the role is across the board. Yep, yep. But in terms of personality. Absolutely. That's right. And I would even state that it's entirely possible that there were two, if we were to posit sort of proto-Satan, as it were, proto-Hasatan, there could be two separate streams or even more separate streams, and we may just be seeing in Job and Zechariah one of those streams, and in Chronicles a different of those streams, and that's entirely possible as well. In other words, it may be possible, it may it may be necessary to say that these are two separate streams. We do happen to see one earlier, uh, Job and Zechariah, and one a little bit later, Chronicles coming later in terms of the writing of that uh, piece of literature. But it may be that they were, in terms of chronology, uh, present in sort of the proto hasatan history uh, from the very beginning. And of course, what we ultimately know is, is where the tradition goes, which is absolutely fascinating. And I'm looking forward to hearing all of you discuss those sorts of things in the coming. Thank you.